So thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanted to thank first of all uh, all the organizers for, for the kind invitation. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've had spent a perfect week. Um, and so I'm going to uh, talk about this um, work, which has been some a set of works uh, well, well, through the past four or five years uh, in collaboration with many people. Uh, so this is a list of uh, uh, names in Paris, most of them, and uh, also some people at Yale, particularly Shyam was sitting there, here, and in, within Michelle's group. So some of the stuff I'm going to talk about are only theoretical proposals, and some of them have been I will have led to experiments already, so I'm going to talk about them. So first of all, let me just uh, motivate a little bit the subject. I'm going to start by explaining what's uh, uh, different when I talk when we talk about stabilization of a quantum system uh, than when we talk about preparation of a quantum state. So in principle, when we talk about stabilization, we are not interested. We are interested not only in preparing a particular state in a robust manner with respect to all the uncertainties of the system. But we want to maintain this state over a long course of time, um, again, so protect it against decoherence uh, or other noise sources. Um, so a particular example, of course, is, for example, uh, stabilizing a manifold of uh, states, as you saw in Michel's talk, where this is the main subject when we talk about quantum error correction, so the central, central subject when we are talking about quantum error correction, we want to protect a manifold of quantum states against decoherence. So in particular, you know, for example, this experiment by Serge Harosh's group, which is uh, one of these first experiments where this uh, st uh, uh, stabilization of a quantum system in real time was performed by reading out the state of this um, uh, cavity um, uh, using Rydberg atoms and then um, Acting back on the state on this state using some uh, uh, so quantum filter and some quantum controller, essentially applying some uh, microwave drive of the uh, well chosen amplitude and phase, we, they could maintain particular Fox state, particular photon number state of this cavity, prepare it, and then maintain it over a long or longer for a um, long time. So uh, we want to do this with superconducting qubits uh, or superconducting circuits. And the, uh, the first problem which comes to mind is that, well, typically here we will wor work with quite short time scales. They have, um, so the superconducting circuits, superconducting qubits in both best cases, they have lifetimes which are of an uh, order of like two orders or three orders of magnitude shorter than this superconducting cavity that was used in Irish experiment. Um, of course, this is not the situation is not that bad because uh, we we know that we have very strong couplings, which should uh, essentially solve for that problem. But uh, the the main issue is that when we want to uh, consider this system and interface it with a classical computer, well, we need to be fast anyways. I mean, if things are going a thousand times faster, we have to be a thousand times faster, or classical electronics have to be a thousand times faster be able to do the same kind of calculation in real time. And that's something hard. So the idea is that, well, how to use the resources of superconducting circuits to go around this problem of fast time scales. So what are the resources? We know that we have a strong untunable couplings and nonlinearities in these uh, systems. We have some flexibility in Hamiltonian designs. We, can, we have a, very, a set of, by the side, a large set of uh, Hamiltonians that we can design. And we have a very nice uh, time and frequency domain control over microwave signals. And that's, uh, these are all some uh, using just commercial electronics. So this is, uh, these are some nice resources that we could try to combine and solve a find a solution. And so the solution is usually in the form of an analog feedback circuit or some idea that I'm going to talk about, which is using the dissipation engineering, reservoir engineering, essentially using uh, some kind of engineered dissipation as a resource to stabilize a particular state of interest. So what is the idea of reservoir engineering? <laughs> so you have this uh, system with Hamiltonian, this which is given here, and that you want to stabilize around a particular state. It might have some, it's decay channels, I'm, I've not shown them here. But um, what the idea is that we're going to try to 
make it interact with another system, another path, in an engineered manner. So we engineer this particular Hamiltonian of interaction between the two. So in order to engineer this, we might use some drives, some microwave drives, which essentially give us some effective Hamiltonian of particular form. And then we're going to use the dissipation of our reservoir to, ori to orient the entropy of our system in a correct manner so that the steady state of the whole system is some state of interest in the system and whatever in the present reservoir. Essentially, we want to engineer this kind of uh, total Hamiltonian that we have here, which is a combination of system Hamiltonian, reservoir Hamiltonian, and its interaction Hamiltonian, such that the dissipation of the reservoir makes us go towards a steady state, which is of the form of a projector of a given state of, a, of our system, which is of our interest, and the, um, uh, an arbitrary state of the reservoir. We don't care really about what's going on in the reservoir. So that's the object of reservoir engineering. So there has been many, a lot of work recent recent years on this. So here are some unexclusive set of names, uh, people who have worked on the, uh, uh, on the theory or experiments around these ideas, especially uh, with superconducting circuits. Um, and so I want, before going forward, I want to say that this is not, historically, we should, if you think about what, in the, in the classical world, how the control was invented, should say, see that, well, we didn't start with this. We didn't have a computer to do classical uh, control of systems. So this is actually a very ancient way of controlling things. This is a what governor, you know, to, to uh, regulate the speed of an engine, of a steam engine. So you know that the way it works is just that when speed goes beyond some particular value, this um, balls start to go up by some centrifugal force and they close a the valve, which doesn't let the engine, uh, the steam go into the engine, so it brings down the speed. And so this paper by Maxwell actually is considered as the first paper in the control theory. This is the paper which showed that, which is called on governors. And so they, he showed that in order to, for this system to be stable, one needs this uh, governor to be, um, to have some amount of friction. So, so dissipation of these um, balls, this governor, is necessary to uh, ensure the stability of this watt governors. So this, this watt governors, of course, were used uh, way before Maxwell, but people, they didn't know why at some points it was, it had this unstable behavior. And so Maxwell essentially did show, show that through uh, writing down the equations that you need a friction to, to, to make this happen. And this is precisely what's going on in uh, quantum systems as, uh, as well. We need this dissipation to ensure the stability of our system. So here I'm the outline of my, my talk. So I'm going to use one particular resource in superconducting circuits to do a set of things. So the resource that I'm going to use is what is called as, uh, as uh, the strong dispersive coupling regime uh, in circuit KD. I'm going, to talk, I'm going to explain what it is. It's a particular coupling regime, uh, which, is, which is quite often used these days in these systems. And we should, we're going to, I'm going to show that we can do a set of nice things with this. So in particular, I'm going to start with a simple thing, uh, which is how to, can we use this as a resource to cool qubits? So it's a, perhaps just an idea very similar to an optical pumping scheme, where we, uh, we can uh, bring the temperature of the qubit below uh, what its initial temperature it, uh, is. Um, uh, or we could just use it as a reset or a qubit. We could do some operations on our qubit, and then we want to make a reset, no matter what the, the final state is, and bring it to the ground state. Then I'm going to show um, if I have. Um, so I'm not perhaps going to talk about all of these. It depends on how much time I'm going to have. I'm going to talk about how the same kind of idea could be used in stabilization, an autonomous stabilization of a bell state of two qubits coupled to a, sing to, to a single cavity. Next, I'm going to show how this same idea could be used to stabilize an entangled state of two qubits inside two different cavities, which are distant with respect to each other. And finally, if I have time, I'm going to talk about how these ideas could be used and to do, in order to do autonomous error correction. Okay, so here is how the, what the system might look like. So we have this, uh, essentially what is, this is how it lo looks like. So you have this LC oscillator coupled to this uh, artificial atom, which is a transmit qubit here. 
So your digitization junction sits here, center. Um, so this could be seen as a, an atom inside a cavity. We have, uh, it's, uh, we might imagine that we have a, a drive um, on the qubit and a drive on the cavity. The cavity is low Q, so we have a dissipation rate of kappa. And we have a coupling between the qubit and cavity, which is of the form of this dispersive interaction. Okay, so we have a chi over two, sigma z a dagger a, uh, which is, which includes the coupling between the two systems. And so what is this disperse, strong dispersive coupling regime that I'm talking about? This is the regime where this chi, this coupling strength chi, is much larger than the line width of the qubit and the cavity. So this is, you have heard about strong coupling regime, so many times this, this is a different regime, which is much stronger actually coupling regime because this is the dispersive coupling, which is now stronger than, uh, than this um, line width. One should note that this chi is usually found as a bracket uh, in, the, in the case where the two qubit and uh, the qubit and cavity are not at resonant, this is found as a approximation uh, in an approximative manner, so which is usually much smaller than G, the coupling, uh, the direct coupling of the qubit and cavity. So, but nowadays we can have typically this chi, which is orders of magnitude larger than this line width, these both line width. And this is the resource that we're gonna try to use in all these uh, proposals that I was mentioning. So in this regime, when we are this, in this regime and we do a spectroscopy for cavity, for example, what we're gonna see is that we're gonna see two peaks for our cavity, uh, one peak corresponding to the case where the qubit is in ground, and one peak when corresponding to the case where the qubit is excited, they're separated by chi, which is much larger than the line width of the cavity, kappa. And the same thing for the qubit. If you put a coherent state inside your cavity and you do a spectroscopy of your qubit, what you're gonna see is many peaks for your qubit based on the number of excitations inside the cavity. So if you have zero photons inside the cavity, you're gonna have this peak. If you have one photon, you're gonna have this peak and two and et cetera. And what's going on, uh, when you have a coherent state, essentially you're gonna see a swing distribution of these peaks. And these, the separation here again is given by chi and line width is gamma or this one over T2 that you see here. So, okay, let's see whether, how can we use this to do something interesting. So the idea is that when you have such a well uh, resolved, you're in such a well resolved regime, you can address these peaks separately in a selective manner. So when you, uh, for example, apply a drive which is at resonance with this frequency, means just that you're gonna drive your cavity uh, select it, uh, conditionally on the qubit being in the, in the excited state. Or when you're driving the qubit at this peak, means just that you're gonna con drive your qubit, you have a rabbit drive on your qubit, condition on cavity being in a given fox state N bar. So this is exactly the resource which is gonna, gonna, we're gonna use. Let's consider, for example, this cooling scheme that I was mentioning. So we use, assume that you have this qubit state ground and excited, uh, and you start with some initial thermal population in the excited state. So you have a mixture of ground and an excited state. And the cavity is in its vacuum state. When you tr t turn on a drive at resonance with this cavity frequency when the qubit is an excited, means just that you're gonna put a coherent state, you're gonna essentially bring this population to a coherent state of the cavity. Now, if you add, you turn on a second drive, which is at frequency of the cube, which is at qubit's frequency when the cavity has n, uh, n um, uh, photons, you make a hole in your coherent state. You have some one part of this population which is going to try uh, start to oscillate between ground and excited. But now, as a, so, we're going to have some population in the ground and n, uh, as you see here. But now. When we are in the ground state, we don't see this drive anymore. So, essentially, this uh, there is the only way is that this cavity is going to decay back to the ground zero. So we have you see that you have kind of a pumping scheme. You have just by turning on a few drives, which is not which are not necessarily very strong drives. You just turn on some kind of uh, pumping scheme, which enables the cooling of the qubit. So bringing this various population from excited to the ground. And the only thing that you've done is just to turn on two CW drives uh, at two given frequencies. There is no phase matching or 
uh, there is a locking or anything of that kind. So just to turn on two drives. And so um, this is this was done experimentally in Michelle's group, uh, 2013. So you, what you could look at, which is perhaps this is a good uh, plot to look at, you could look at just the dashed lines. Maybe it's the easiest thing. So if you don't do anything, the qubit, there is going to be some spurious thermal population in the qubit. So in this particular ex uh, experience, we had about a 10% uh, uh, thermal population in the excited state, which is quite a lot. But it happens uh, often in speconacting qubits. And so if you don't do anything, uh, well, you're going to stay there. If you just, uh, well, no, that's what you should, should look at is this one, actually. This is when you don't do anything. When you don't, uh, so you start from the 10% population in uh, excited state and 90% in ground state. So this is excited state population. But then if you turn on the, uh, the, the two drives that I was mentioning, uh, what you see is that in a matter of two, uh, two microseconds, you have uh, cooled down your qubit to, its, uh, to a much lower thermal population. It turns out to be about 1% thermal population. Bring uh, the thermal population from 10% to 1%. Uh, and essentially, this qubit ha had a lifetime of about 37 microseconds. And so we, it, we had a reset, we brought this reset time. So if you know, start from the excited state and you wait, you need 37 microseconds to, to get back to this level. What you see here is just that by turning on these two drives, we bring this reset time to something of order two or three microseconds. Okay, so that's. Uh, uh, that's nice, and the important thing is just that it's very robust as well. So what you see in this plot is that, for example, by this is the you have two parameters here, so the strength of the cavity drive and the strength of the qubit drive, and you see that in a big, in a large set of uh, uh, parameters, for a large set of parameters, you're going to have uh, pretty much the same reset time, uh, about one microsecond. Okay, so this is a very simple thing. Of course, it's not so much interesting because what we are stabilizing is just a ground state. You could have done it, actually, you could, you could have just changed this drive and put it there, and then you would have stabilized the excited state of this qubit. So you could have just, uh, this is slightly more interesting. But now let's see whether we can we do something much more interesting. So for example, stabilize a bell state of two qubits. So again, we consider here two qubits coupled to a single cavity. So this is the frequency of the qubit A, which is qubit Alice, qubit Bob, which is uh, omega, at frequency omega B, and then cavity, which is at frequency omega C. These frequencies could be all very different from each other. The two qubits are both coupled in, a disperse, with a dis, in this dispersive regime to the cavities with some associated chi's, chi couplings. And then you have, as, a, as previously, you have some drives on the cavity and the qubit a and B. And what we want to do is to stabilize a bell state of these two, so these two qubits. So th these are the main ideas. We're going to use some kind of symmetry. So we're going to try to engineer this uh, sequence in a manner such that uh, these chi's are pretty similar, pretty much similar. The frequencies of the qubits could be very different, but the chi's to the cavity need to be similar. Then what would happen? Then if you do the same spectroscopy experience that I uh, was mentioning, you're going to see for the cavity three peaks. One peak which is going to be associated to the two qubits being in the ground state, one peak associated to two qubits being in the excited state, and then there is going to be one peak corresponding to the one of the qubits being in the ground and the other one in the excited. The fact that uh, the chi's are the same corresponds to the fact that these two states correspond to the same peak. If you do the spectroscopy of the two qubits, like uh, Alice, uh, Alice's qubit or Bob's qubit, what you see is that, well, you have many peaks as a function of number of excitations inside the cavity, just like previously. So this is the first resource we're going to use, using, which is similar to the last experience. The second resource is that um, if, you, uh, if you consider this kind of Hamiltonian, sigma x a plus sigma x Bob, and you apply it to this uh, uh, bell state, excited ground plus ground excited, you're going to bring it to the ground, ground plus excited, excited. But if you make it act on this other bell state with the opposite sign, you get zero. So this is the dark state of this Hamiltonian. 
and vice versa, if you change the sign of sigma xA minus and sigma xP, this is going to be the other well state, which is going to become a dark state. So which means just that if you apply Rabi drives whose phase are chosen such that you have such kind of Hamiltonian acting on the two qubits, then with this spell state is going to be a dark state, and we make one of the phases to be pi, pi shifted, then we're going to have the other state, which is going to become a dark state. Now let's see what's, what can we do. So we start from even state of the, uh, any state, essentially an arbitrary state of the two qubit system, the cavity being in the vacuum. So we have, this is the ground ground state, this is excited excited state, and this is the two bell states. So phi minus is the state, the bell state with the sign minus. And uh, phi plus is, well, one with plus sign. So the idea is just simply that if you turn on two drives one on the cavity, which are resonant with these two peaks. Now what's, what's going to go on is just that you're going to derive your cavity condition on the qubits being in the ground ground or excited excited. What we want to do, by the way, is to establish this state, phi minus state. Okay, so we turn on this. We're going to put a coherent state inside the cavity around some photon number n. Condition on the two qubits being in ground or two qubits being in excited. Now if we add two drives on the, two, uh, on the qubits, Alice and Bob, which are at the frequency corresponding to zero photons inside the cavity, so which means that we are acting on our qubits in this manifold, on none of the other manifolds corresponding to other Fox states. And these two drives are chosen, they, their phases are chosen such that the phi minus is a dark state, so that, that's what we saw there. So we are essentially applying this sigma xA plus sigma xB. What happens is just that if you now you have some population in phi plus, this is going to be sorry, driven through these arrows towards these two states as well. Now we add two other drives at the, on Alice and Bob, uh, when the cavity is in n, has n number, uh, n, pho uh, n photons inside. But now we choose the phases of these pumps such that the phi plus is a dark state. And what happens is just that you're going to bring this population to this one. And when you're here, you don't see the drives, the two drives on the cavities. So you, the only th choice you have is to decay back to phi minus. So you have a pumping scheme which brings wherever you are in this state, you bring, which brings it back to phi minus. So essentially now if you have a T1 jump, for example, you're, you end up in GG, for example, this brings you back through this pumping to the state and corrects for this kind of decay. If you have a T5 jump, the same thing happens. You have a protection which brings it back to the, to the phi minus state. So essentially, the only thing we do here is just to turn on six drives this is the only thing. <laughs> this is Xiang's work, actually. You turn on six drives, uh, two on the cavity and two on each of qubits. You need to do some fa fa phase flocking here because you need to have at least the phase of these uh, Alice and Bob uh, to be fixed such that we have this and the same thing in the other manifold. And then you can do this. So this is the experimental results, which was done like three years ago as well by Shem and Michel's group. So, and what you see is that you stabilize the Bell state with some given fidelity. So what, why this fidelity is not one, it takes you some time to stabilize. So this process takes you, has a, some constant of time and you have, which you have to compare to the decay time of your qubit. Essentially each time you stop your experiment, you might be through the, you might be uh, correcting your might be going, uh, the, the correction is may, maybe happening during that time. So that's why it means just that if you look at the average value at any point in time, you have some given fidelity, which appears in here to be 80%. I think this was a more recent experiment than this first, this nature paper. And so what is interesting is just that you could go far in time. So you could go to 500 microseconds, even though the qubit's lifetimes here, it was about 20 or 30 microseconds. And you still keep this fidelity uh, over a very long time. So this is really a stabilization protocol in that sense. Keep really this 
against that were long, arbitrary long times. Okay, so now let's see whether, what can we do next. So we can try to do the same thing in a more interesting manner, let's say, two qubits in two different cavities. So this is an important resource if you want to do distributed computation, you want to have a resource, well, you, as a resource you want to have a distant entanglement so that you could use, for example, do, use this, for example, for quantum teleportation. Uh, so, okay, you know, we know that with only local operations and classical communication, there is no way to make uh, uh, an entanglement between these two. We need some kind of, some source of entanglement here. And so, uh, all source of entanglement is going to be actually a squeezing, a two-mode squeezing. We apply, we, this is pretty much the JPC that we have seen many times so far. You could imagine that you have this JPC uh, where you have a pump at frequency omega 1 and omega 2, omega 1 being the frequency of this cavity, omega 2 being the frequency of this cavity. Then what it generates is a two-mode squeezed vacuum. Okay. These two-mode squeezed vacuum are then going to drive these two cavities. So this is essentially the quantum correlated source which is going to give us the entanglement. We're going to try to accumulate the squeezing provided by this squeezer, two-mode squeezer, to stabilize an entangled state of the two distant, cavity, uh, two distant qubits. We also assume that we have as another resource some local drives on the qubits. Okay? So, what is, how, how can we write the Hamiltonian of the system? So, okay, the initial Hamiltonian, so the simple Hamiltonian of this system is as before. I haven't written it. It's just you have some chi, A dagger A. So let me just see if I have used A1 dagger A1 sigma Z1 plus chi. So this is chi1 and chi2. A2 dagger A2 sigma Z2. So we have coupling of each qubit to its cavity. We have assumed here, again, the same kind of symmetry, chi1 and chi2 are the same, uh, as in the previous experiment. And then you can write this, the same Hamiltonian, you can reformulate it, we can write, rewrite it in this manner. So sigma gg is this uh, projection over ground ground, and uh, sigma e is projection over ee, sigma minus plus is what, what sends phi double state minus to what double state plus and vice versa. And the N and M operators are the sum of the photon number operators and the difference of photon number operators. So this, all, this Hamiltonian can be rewritten in this form. Okay. What this two-mode two, two squeezing does is just that it changes your decay uh, channel of your cavities to this a little bit more weird uh, decay channels, non-standard decay channels. So essentially, your, your ca cavities are going to decay through this operators. This is going to be the Lindblad operators, your uh, Lindblad equation, master equation. We're going to have two of them, but they're going to be a uh, combination of A1 and A2 daggers, A2 and A1, uh, A1 dagger. This is just the result of this two-mode squeezing. Effect. So what's going to go on now? So just with, uh, without this local drives, if you don't consider these local drives on the qubits, What's going to go on is just that if you are in this manifold of ground ground or excited excited state, this is going to be the part of the Hamiltonian which is going to act for you. And if you are in the manifold of the Bell states, this is going to be the part of the Hamiltonian which is going to act. Because uh, you see that this is acting on the even subspace of the qubit and this is acting on the odd subspace of the qubit. There is no interaction between odd and even. So what, we can, what one can show is that if you have this Hamiltonian, together with this dissipation, one can show that the cavity has, is going to have as steady state a two-mode squeezed vacuum state. Okay, so I'm not going to show that here, but just believe it, believe me about that. And one can one can show is that if you have this other Hamiltonian and this dissipation channel, the cavity's a steady state is going to be a two-mode squeezed thermal state instead of a two-mode squeezed vacuum state. So these are going to be two different kind type of states, whether you are you have a, a you have the two qubits in the ground or excited. The reason is I can maybe just mention why the reason is M operator is the difference of photon numbers commutes with somehow with the squeezing action, but uh, the N is the sum of the uh, photon numbers, 
and it actually gives you a, a detuning in your squeezing operation and brings you to thermal states, thermal squeeze states. Now, if you turn on this local drives on the qubits with well chosen phases, such that the phi minus is a dark state, what you're going to have is just that whenever you're in ground ground or excited excited, you might drive them to phi plus in both manifolds. So this is these drives, these qubit drives are chosen at frequency of the qubit when the cavity is zero photons, but zero photon is present in both manifolds here. Okay, so you're going to have this. The interesting thing is that in this manifold, because of this action, you have also some interaction between phi minus and phi plus. Why is that so? Because you see that if the M has some fluctuation, because as you have, uh, you're in a two mode squeezed thermal state, the M operator is not zero. If you were in a two mode squeezed, uh, two mode squeezed vacuum state, M is zero because uh, the difference of number of photons in a two-mode squeeze vacuum state is zero. So in this uh, manifold, the phi minus and phi plus are not coupled to each other. In this manifold, they are coupled to each other. So if you look now at the graph of this whole thing, you see that again, this phi minus state is the steady state of your system. So everything will end up in this phi minus state. I think that's good, uh, the steady state. So in the, this is, these are some numerical simulations. What is interesting here is that you could start, we could work with a very small squeezing. You could imagine that this two-mode squeezer only make, gives you a 0, 1 dB squeezing, for example. And you would eventually end up in a 100% fidelity bell state. So this is kind of accumulation of entanglement so that you stabilize an entangled state at the end. Of course, what you gain by going towards a higher uh, value of squeezing is just that you're going to have a faster convergence towards this. Uh, the stang entangles. Okay, so now we could also in, 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 try to, uh, to consider some more imperfections in our system. So what happens here is just that, uh, well, these lines are usually lossy because of these circulators there, for example. And so we couldn't, for example, come here and take into account what, uh, what happens if this, we could take into account the transmission efficiency of these lines. And unfortunately, things are not so good. Uh, so if you were perfect efficiency, essentially this, is, this shows us that we can get, no matter what the, the value of the squeezing parameter, we can get to 100% concurrence uh, for the qubits. That's what I showed previously. Now if you just bring this uh, transmission efficiency to 90%, you see that, well, we have an important drop of what is the, the best concurrence we can get you know, as a steady state. But what is interesting, so how, however, is just that we, you realize that for small squeezing, you have a better performance. Somehow you make your system uh, more robust to this imperfection if you use a smaller squeezing. So that's, that's I would say, the, the nice thing about this protocol is just that you could uh, have a compromise of how fast you converge towards the entangled state and how uh, robust you are with respect to transmission efficiency. Yes? Oh, it uh, it's, continues to go up. It's it's uh, yeah, yeah. No, it it continues to go up. But the only thing is just that uh, if you look at what's going on here, it it means just that if you are, for example, at zero one dB, you have let's say uh, ten to the power four uh, times longer than kappa. So it means that if you, you have to compare this convergence time to the T one and T two time of your qubits, so it doesn't make sense to go much. So it seems like at 1 and 2 dB, we can still hope to get something because here we have, let's say, two orders of one order of magnitude, a uh, slower convergence than kappa. And if we have qubits which are 1,000 times or 10,000 times, let's say, uh, better than this kappa, then we can hope to have some uh, concurrence. So it's, as a matter of, uh, as a function of the parameters of our system, we can essentially decide on how, what's the value of, optimal value of squeezing that we should use to get the optimal concurrence. Okay, so um, I think the, this finishes. This hasn't been experimented yet. <laughs> and then there is this last one. I'm not going to talk about it. I think I have, I see I have just one minute. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I mean, just I will, I'll let you know that, that we had this idea of how using to use it, precisely the same kind of ideas to do a bit flip, uh, correction of bit flips in an autonomous manner. Uh, I'm not going to explain how it works. Essentially, the idea is that you need some kind of symmetry and some kind of strong dispersive coupling regime.
to be able to do uh, to do something to, to have uh, to be able to stabilize any superposition of zero zero and one one one. So which is uh, again speed flips, not phase flips, so because we know we know that with three QEs we can only protect systems again basic speed flips, not phase flips. However, as as uh, Michel mentioned it in his uh, talk, we can also combine this. I haven't I have managed not to talk about cats till now, <laughs> but uh, we can come we can manage to use uh, this idea combined with cats and have a full protection of a. Uh, of uh, of uh, full quantum error correction of uh, these uh, states. So let me just conclude. I think uh, the interesting thing about all these ideas are is that we use only um, simple things. So CW drives of given amplitudes and frequencies uh, of given frequencies. Usually we have a kind of ro some robustness to amount of the amplitude to the amplitude, and sometimes we need some phase uh, blockings as well. Usually, this is what is needed. And what you, you use as a resource here is strong dispersive coupling between qubits and cavities. Some separation of what is needed really is separation of time scales between high Q systems and low Q systems. So the systems you want to stabilize and the systems you want to use to stabilize. So this is essentially the resource which is important. I, don't, I think what's important here is just that the absolute value of T1 and T2 is not important. It's really the separation. Uh, off between T1, uh, between T1 and T2 and 1 over cup of the cavity, which matters here. You need some amount of symmetry, as you said, and we could also, this is the, on the last part, we use also parametric methods, I didn't talk about that. So these are essentially the resources that we could combine and come up with a bunch of ideas uh, around this system to stabilize various states. So yeah, I would like, I yeah, can finish here, I think. And, The uh, <clears throat> entanglement generation with the, the two-mode squeezing is a really cool idea. So am I correct that eta was, is sort of the squeezing efficiency? Is that no, no, eta was the transmission efficiency between the, between the squeeze, between the JPC and, so e between each okay. of the, the... Yeah, so, it, okay, so that's, can, is there, it's, I'm just surprised at how rapidly um, the, the fidelity of the entangled state degrades with the, that, yes, that was concurrence, by the way. It wasn't fidelity, though. Okay, but, okay. but it's, I mean, that, you know, 80%. Yeah, that's true. Well, first Is of, there any intuitive way to see why that's so uh, unfavorable? Well, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, okay, so that's, uh, uh, first of all, uh, when I say 80%, it means 80% on this one and 80% on that one. So which means that I mean, it's like uh, worse than 80% if you consider the whole thing. But, uh, uh, so, I, I mean, in principle, what happens is just that these two mode squeeze states are really, uh, are really fragile with respect to this kind of transmission efficiency. Uh, as soon as you add uh, this, you have, you induce, you, you, try, you come start to couple these two states even, because your steady state, uh, even when you are in this odd manifold, is not going to be any more really the, the squeezed vacuum. It's going to be squeezed thermal state as well. So you're going to have some kind of coupling between this five, five, 5 plus and 5 minus, even in this manifold. And that's what makes it work the way you see it. But, uh, I mean, I guess there, are, there might be some ways to optimize this, uh, this protocol. That's what we are trying to work. These are very hard simulations, I, was, I should say, because when you want to go to high, uh, you have two cavity modes, two qubits. When you want to go to high values of squeezing, usually uh, it's a... Uh, I had a question about the last part that you showed very briefly yeah. about autonomous quantum error correction. Can I understand this as stabilizing a subspace instead of just one state? Precisely, yes. Yeah. How does this work? So, yeah, maybe I could just show it, uh, show the, yeah, here is the main idea. So we managed to put the system in a way that if you look at the reservoir's frequency as a function of the qubit state, uh, when the qubits are all in zero, the cav uh, or all in one, in some rotating frame, they see the same frequency. The cavity has this fre the same frequency. But when you go towards one zero zero, uh, you have a different frequency. You shift by some minus value chi, and when you go to zero one one, you shift to plus value. And the, you then you turn on two drives, which essentially couples these two, 
whereas the other coupling is never turned on. Essentially, if you start from any superposition of these two states, you're going to have, a, and then you jump eventually towards this bit flipped state. So you start from 0, 0, 0, and you, one, one, a superposition of 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1. You jump towards a superposition of 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 1. Then these drives will bring you back to the same superposition, but with one excitation inside the cavity, which is then going to eventually decay back to the, the same superposition with zero state. So we have kind of a pumping scheme which acts in a manifold, and for which the two states remain degenerate through the whole process, whether they, are, they have flipped or not. No, that's, so that's, of course, uh, this is a bit flip error correction, not a uh, phase. If you want to do phase flip error correction, then this becomes much more elaborated. And that's why we rather use qubits, for, uh, cat qubits for that, because they are inherently somehow protected against these phase flips, and then we can imagine using this idea. Using uh, two-mode squeezing to entangle two yes. qubits due to Serac. And there you need a lot of entanglement, Precisely. a lot of two-mode squeezing. Precisely. Is it more, so. If you have a lot of two-mode squeezing, though, is that approach more robust to losses? No, that's actually, so that's uh, what, so I, I, if I um, remember correctly, it's going to be pretty much the same kind of uh, performance with respect to losses, but you need, uh, 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 if you want 100% efficiency, you need uh, infinite squeezing. So uh, here, the idea was that can we, by using this idea, make it more robust? It appears that well, it seems like if you have very good qubits, yes. <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's, the, that's the answer. Yeah. So usually, um, if you look at atoms um, or ions, and if you use a pumping scheme to sort of bring, stabilize a state, there is some kind of recoil heating. So I, it's clear that here you're sort of, there is no motional degree of freedom. But is there anything in your system that changes because you keep pumping for a long time, does your line width or something change over, I mean, over like generations? No, so this is, I mean, I, th I think there is this uh, difference here is just that with this resource of strong dispersive regime, we are not uh, that much, uh, we don't need to use some, let's say, to turn on some forbidden uh, transitions by applying high, uh, very strong drives. We just usually use just resonant uh, resonant couplings. So in all the three uh, proposals that I showed you, except the fourth one that I didn't show you, we never use any parametric pumping, for example. So these are very uh, weak drives, and uh, eventually they're not, none of them are really strong drives. And um, no, as far as I know, I, there, is, there could be no problem there. We haven't observed any problems in this, in this experiments, I think. 